Does every set or collection of numbers have a size, a length or a width? In other words, is it possible for a set to be sizeless? Let's start with sets that do have a well-defined notion of size. Technically, in mathematics, we call size the Lebesgue measure. It formalizes the notion of length in one dimension, area in two dimensions, and volume in three dimensions. We'll use this notation to mean the size of a set S. Pretty much everything about the Lebesgue measure feels intuitive. The size of this line segment that extends from zero to three is three, and the size of this single point is zero. If we know this set has size two and we slide it over, it should still have size two. That property is called translation invariance. The size of these two disjoint line segments, meaning that the two line segments don't have any points in common, is just the sum of their two sizes. That property is called additivity. In fact, if we take the union or combine together countably many disjoint sets, their sizes still add. That's called countable additivity. Since a single point has size zero, countable additivity tells us that any countable collection of points, like all the integers, also has size zero. After all, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero is just zero. But an interval, like zero to one, contains uncountably many points. We can't simply add together uncountably many zeros, and so its size is not just the sum of the size of the points. This definition of size, using the Lebesgue measure, is quite robust. Pretty much any set you can think of has a well-defined size. In fact, it was quite the challenge for mathematicians to devise a set without a size. So, how do you create such a set? Start with the interval zero to one. We're going to sort all the numbers in the interval into bins in a sort of unusual way. There will be infinitely many bins. We're going to put all the numbers whose difference is rational in the same bin. In other words, look at two numbers in our interval x and y. If x minus y is a rational number, they go in the same bin. But if x minus y is an irrational number, they go in different bins. This is an example of separating things into equivalence classes. Let's look at these bins in a little more detail. If you take any two rationals and subtract one from another, you get a rational. So one bin will contain all the rational numbers, like one quarter and two thirds and 999 thousandths. But if you take any two irrationals and subtract one from another, the result might not be a rational number so they can't all go in the same bin. We have to split the irrationals into mini bins. For example, one bin will contain the square root of two divided by two, and all the numbers that differ from it by a rational, like the square root of two divided by two plus one one hundredths, and the square root of two divided by two minus one quarter. What about the square root of two divided by three? Well, the square root of two divided by two minus the square root of two divided by three is the square root of two divided by six, which is irrational. So the square root of two divided by three is in a different bin than the square root of two divided by two. In this way, all the numbers between zero and one show up in exactly one bin. One way to visualize the bins are as shifted copies of the rational numbers. All the rationals are in the first bin, but if we shift them over a little bit, until one of the points hits the square root of two over two, then they become the contents of that bin. If we shift them again until one of the points hits the square root of two over three, then they become the contents of that bin. I wanna be clear that this is a metaphor, a helpful visualization. Now, we'll form a new set S by selecting one representative from each bin. For example, S might contain one quarter from the first bin, square root of two over two from the second bin, and square root of two over three minus three tenths from the third bin, and so on. We don't know exactly what the contents of S are, but we know that it contains exactly one representative from each bin. Here's the big punchline. This new set S has no size. It's non-measurable. Let's explore why. The proof that S is non-measurable is a little tricky. So during this next segment, I'd encourage you to pause and rewatch whenever it's helpful. First, we'll list all the rational numbers between negative one and one. 
R1, R2, R3, and so on. Remember, there's countably many rational numbers, so it's no problem to make a list like this. Then we'll define a bunch of new sets, S1, S2, S3, and so on, which are essentially just copies of S shifted by the rational numbers R1, R2, R3. To be more precise, here's how you define the set S1. Take each element in S and add R1 to it. The set S2 is defined by adding R2 to each element in S, and so on. So if we visualize S as a bunch of dots between 0 and 1, then each of the S1, S2, S3, and so on are just copies of S shifted a bit. They'll be between negative 1 and 2. Let's make two crucial observations about these copies of S. First observation, they're disjoint. That means that there is no point which is in both SI and SJ for any two different numbers I and J. Second observation, every number between 0 and 1 is in one of the copies of S. Every number between 0 and 1 is in either S1 or S2 or S3 and so on. Your challenge problem for the week is to prove these two observations. Now, let's take the union of all the S1, S2, S3, and so on. In other words, we're going to stick them all together. Because they're disjoint, by the property of countable additivity, the size of the union is equal to the size of S1 plus the size of S2 plus the size of S3, and so on. We also know that the union is inside the interval negative 1 to 2, so its size has to be less than 3. But by the first observation, it includes the entire interval 0 to 1. So its size has to be bigger than 1. In other words, the size of the union must be between 1 and 3. Now, notice if S has a size, whatever that size may be, then each of the copies, S1, S2, S3, and so on, are also the same size as S. That's because they're just shifted copies of S, and by the property of translation invariance, shifting doesn't change size. Using our previous formula and the fact that the size of each S1, S2, S3, and so on is the same as the size of S, we now know that the size of the union of all the copies is just the size of S added to itself infinitely many times. This is a problem. We said that the size of the union of all the copies is between 1 and 3. Whatever the size of S is, there's no way to add that number infinitely many times and get a number between 1 and 3. If the size of S is 0, then the infinite sum gives 0. And if the size of S is something positive, even a really tiny number, we'll still get infinity when we add it to itself infinitely many times. Therefore, the size of S can't be 0 and it can't be non-zero. It can't have a size. The set S must be non-measurable. Let's dive into one very important but subtle part of the definition of S. To construct a non-measurable set, a set without a well-defined notion of size, we used the axiom of choice. The historically controversial set theory axiom of choice states that, given a possibly infinite collection of non-empty sets, we can form a new set that contains one element from each set. In other words, we are choosing one element from each set. The frustrating part about the axiom of choice is that it doesn't tell us which element is being chosen. We don't know exactly what the contents of our new collection are. We used the axiom of choice early on when we selected one element from each bin to form the set S. zermelo frankel set theory is the standard axiomatic basis for mathematics. There are nine basic axioms, and set theorists have spent the last century exploring what happens when you add other axioms, most noticeably the axiom of choice. Technically, two of these are schemas, which stand in for infinitely many axioms. The set S that we created is the most commonly presented non-measurable set. There are other options, but they all use the axiom of choice, or a similar axiom. In other words, using the basic ZF axioms, it's impossible to create a non-measurable set, a set without a size. A notable related result, and most people's favorite consequence of the axiom of choice, is the Banach-Tarski paradox. In the Banach-Tarski paradox, you take a solid sphere, break it into a finite number of pieces, actually as few as five pieces, depending on the construction, and then put those pieces back together to form two solid spheres, each the same size as the original. You have doubled the sphere. 
It's okay if that feels confusing. It's called a paradox for a reason. If you want to see the detailed construction, check out the Vsauce video linked in the description. The magic behind the Banach-Tarski paradox is in the axiom of choice. The pieces you break the sphere into are non-measurable. They require the axiom of choice, or something similar, to construct. For some people, this alleviates their sense of anxiety over the paradox. By invoking the axiom of choice and non-measurable sets, the Banach-Tarski paradox is outside the domain of our physical intuitions. I vividly remember the first time I learned about the Banach-Tarski paradox and the construction of non-measurable sets. They stretched the limits of my mathematical intuition and imagination. Let us know in the comments your favorite consequence of the axiom of choice. People had a lot to say about our brain's mini-series. Circuitrinos asked, how are the characteristics of such a large graph calculated? Does it take a long time? Basically, yes. It's definitely computationally expensive and uses some very specific tools. The methods section of the paper says, Betty numbers and Euler characteristic are computed from the directed flag complexes. All homology computations carried out in this paper were made with F2 coefficients using the boundary matrix reduced by an algorithm from the PHAT library, which is an open source C++ library designed for topological data analysis. Samuel Gershon says, Something I don't understand is that mathematicians and physicists often say that the fourth dimension is difficult to visualize, but they don't say it's impossible. Does that mean it's possible to see in those dimensions? You'd probably get many different answers to this question if you asked different mathematicians. But here's my take. You can't see four dimensions like you can literally see three dimensions. But you can improve your intuition about the shape and relative orientation of objects in a theoretical 4D space. And this intuition can be really helpful in mathematics. Pete Magnuson asked a great question. Why plot the first and third Betty numbers? Is there something different about them compared to, say, the second and fifth? And Gelid Ganef gave a great answer. Their research was interested in cliques and cavities formed in response to stimuli, but they were also interested in the dimensionality of those cavities. The reason they picked three is because it's the highest Betty number where cavities consistently appeared in their data set. They used it to give a contrast between lower dimensional Betty cavities and higher dimensional ones. They said that the neural matter did form up to Betty 5 cavities, but apparently this wasn't consistent enough to get good data from. I don't know why they skipped Betty 2, unless that data wouldn't have provided any extra clarity than the Betty 1 and Betty 3 data did. Tying it back to Circuitrino's question, Maybe it had to do with the computational expense. Thanks for all the great comments.